will talk about discovery and prediction for molecules and crystalline materials using graph based deep learning models uh, over to you professor gongoli hello uh, yes professor gongoli we can hear you and we can see your screen you just give me a second can you see my screen and it is full screen uh so we can see your screen but it is not full screen so i can see your current slide next slide and now? dic yeah now it is full screen super okay. yep yep now we can see great yes, thank you <laughs> so thanks the organizers for inviting i i guess i am audible am i audible yeah. Yes, yes, Professor Ganguly, you are audible. Okay, thank you. Thank so you. this work is on learning representations for molecules and crystalline materials using graph-based deep learning models. And I am Niloy Ganguly, and uh, I am a professor at Indian Institute of Technology, Kharagpur. But presently, I am a visiting professor at Leibniz University of Hanover, Germany. So one of the interesting problems, which uh, is also um, uh, been discussed in the deep learning plus graph-based domain is like discovery of new plausible drug-like molecules. And we know that drug discovery goes through various phases, where in the stage one, 10,000 components are compounds are created. And from there, we get 250 to five, ultimately one component comes out in the open. So as you understand, this is a very deep and, uh, mm, mm, and detailed process. So one interesting thing would be, one interesting surface would be, if we can reduce the number 10,000 or number 250, then the, and then, and then the speed at which new drugs will be discovered, which be, will be much faster. Similarly, when we see fast and accurate pre precision of uh, pre property prediction of crystals, we have molecules, crystals, and uh, there are new crystals which are synthesized, but we need a fast uh, way of detecting the properties of these crystals or detecting or, or um, accurately calculating the properties of these crystals so that before they are put into production, even before they are put into production, we know whether the, pro whether the crystal would be useful for certain purpose or not. So with this uh, in mind, let me put the forward the agenda for today. The agenda is to leverage the power of deep learning framework to learn robust representation of molecules and crystals. And for molecules and crystals, graph-based representations are a natural choice. Hence, we can more specifically try to explore the recent developments of graph neural networks. So we have to remember this chemical graphs are special category of graphs where we have 3D atomic structures along with different bond types, bond distance, atomic uh, chemical properties, et cetera, et cetera. So, more specifically, our goal is to develop deep learning framework for molecular and crystal graphs to encode their structural and chemical information in an enriched representation space. With this, uh, the tasks are twofold. We can think of tasks as twofold, like discovering new drug-like molecules, which is a molecular uh, molecule discovery, and fast and accurate prediction of different properties of crystals, which is like chemical screening and property prediction. So with this in mind, I present the first work of ours, a deep generative models for molecular graphs. And uh, these are my co-authors who have been participating in this project. So generative models for molecular designs. Uh, there is a flurry of work on deep generative models. And as we are talking, more and more works are coming on this in this area. And there has been two 
major approaches. One is the text-based approach that represent molecules using smile string. So smile string is a special way of representing molecule and then use deep generative models for text. So this has been a line of work. The other line of work which we follow represent molecules using, using molecular graphs and then need to develop deep generative models for molecular graphs. So this is the line of functions which we follow. And then limitations of existing works are like, when you have this text-based approach, smile strings do not capture structural similarity between molecules. And a single molecule can have multiple smiles representation, while multiple molecules can have the same smile representation. So there is no like one is to one mapping and that leads to, I will show results, lack of validity on the generated molecules. While graph-based molecule approaches, uh, so, so this is just the work before, that's the, the literature survey before we have work. And as we are, as I am presenting um, our work, many, many new papers are always coming out in this area. So graph-based approaches can only generate and be trained on molecules with the same number of atoms. And so if you train a graph-based molecules with 10 atoms, then the output was also coming as 10 atoms before we really attempted this work. And it is not invariant to permutation. So permutations means C uh, like carbon and hydrogen many times is not thought to be equal to hydrogen and carbon, which is not true in a chemical bond or chemical graphs or chemical molecule sort of things. And it many times generate molecular graphs by combining a small sort of graphlet. So uh, uh, as the previous uh, uh, previous speaker was talking about motifs, so uh, generating molecular graphs by combining some small set of motifs, which is good to give some structure, but it leads to lack of diversity on the generated molecules. With this in mind, we propose Nibhae, uh, a variational autoencoder for, uh, for graphs. So it has a probabilistic encoder and it has a probabilistic decoder. And what does the encoder takes? The encoder takes uh, the, the nodes, the edges, and the node properties. So the node properties can be two types. The node properties can be either the molecule name, carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, and the this is a 3D molecule. We are thinking of a 3D structure. So, and the coordinate where the molecule is there. While the edge weight can be single, double, triple bonds, triple bonds, and the weights of the bonds accordingly. So we have this probabilistic encoders and we put them the typical VAE structure. We put them in a latent embedding space and then we do the probabilistic decoder from, uh, from the, uh, from by sampling from, uh, from this latent embedding space. So let us go a little more into detail. The probabilistic encoder, it's aggregate the, like a typical GNN in aggregates neighborhood information using symmetric uh, uh, aggregator function. So we have the node properties, node properties F, node properties F, which is uh, the graph, which is whether it is carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and also the also the coordinates and that is put along with the edge properties edge properties and edge and we work up till k hops so there is a symmetric aggregator up till k hops and each node is a representation of its k hop neighbors okay and this way we get the k hop neighborhood Thing. And accordingly, we do a MLP, a simple MLP sort of things, and we represent it in a latent space in terms of Z. And maybe uh, uh, where Z is, you have a mean and standard deviation along with it. So this is how the probabilistic encoder is put. So for the probabilistic decoder, uh, you uh, given this Z, and perhaps given the number of uh, edges, number of nodes as an input, number of nodes as an input, we first do the node feature decoder 
and then we also get the edge number, number of edges which we want to get. And with the node features and the edge number, we can get the edge decoder. Edge decoder means whether it is uh, uh, whether there is an edge or not. So edge decoder because is the edge number means total number of edges in the graph so say let that be k dash and whether there is an edge or not and what type of edge it is whether it is a single bond whether it's a single bond or whether it's a double bond or it can be also a triple bond so let us uh, think a little more in details that when we do this, there is another interesting thing which happens, which needs to be taken into consideration. If you see, if you see the, mm -hmm. if you see the molecule as such, a molecule has a special structure. Molecule has a special structure, and inside the molecules there is hardly any. There are hardly any mm -hmm. edges. There are hardly any. Uh, edges or hardly any triangles. Uh, there are hardly any triangles which are present. There are hardly any triangles which are present. And why this is? This is a special feature of the molecules. So now what we want, we want to do some sort of masking to remove triangles. And we want to generate triangle free graphs. We want to generate triangle free graphs. So what happens as soon as we generate our edge, we try to see whether it forms a triangle or not. And this can be done very simply through some, uh, some uh, clever data structures. And we can, you can see that in the paper. So what is essentially happening when we are doing the edge decoding, we are ensuring that no triangles are formed. And then the other probabilistic decoding which happens is the, co is the node features, the coordinates. And once we have this, we have the, uh, just to recollect, we have the node features, the edge, at, whether the edge is there or not, uh, the weights of the edge, whether it is a single bond or a double bond, then the nodes coordinates. And once we get all this uh, information about the graph, once we get all this information about the gra graph or the molecule, we do some sort of post-processing to see that whether the molecule which we have generated has some sort of minimum potential energy and that can be done through this software uh, Gaussian. So just to tell you that we have chemistry people in this paper and we are learning a lot of things from, from the domain people and they are also helping in building up this, uh, building up this algorithm. So this is how things goes and we have uh, how this is how things goes and then we have a, a training part and in the training part we train by maximizing elbow that is the, like the KL divergence we take the KL divergence and also we have to take the maximum likelihood. So when we are generating the maximum likelihood just just there is one trick which I should I must mention that when we are generating uh, uh, maximum likelihood, when we generating a graph, the maximum likelihood would depend upon the sequence in which the edges are generated. So in order to avoid that, so that we can make the training permutation invariant, we 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 continuously sample source nodes. We continuously sample source nodes, or multiple times we sample the source nodes and do a breadth first search, so that the effect of edge sequence gets minimized, and that way training becomes permutation invariant. So coming to the experimental setup. We sample molecules from two data sets of drug-like molecules like zinc and QM9 data set. These are the two standard molecule, to, uh, molecule data sets which are present. For each molecule in each data set, we construct a molecular graph, uh, graph. And then there are these experimental results. So let us uh, concentrate on this first result. One first result is what we want to check. We want to check whether the latent space which we have created through our encoding decoding techniques is smooth or not. What does it smooth means? So say there are two properties. One is, uh, the, so there are two properties. One is Z, we have Z, the, the mean and the standard deviation. So we have two properties of Z, mean and standard deviation. 
So with mean and standard deviations, what we are doing here, we have two properties, mean and standard deviation. So what we are essentially doing, essentially we are slowly changing the standard deviation in the x-axis and seeing as we change the standard deviation a bit, whether the graph also changes a bit. And in the y-axis, we are changing the mean a bit and seeing whether the graph also changes a mean. So that would indicate that this z is smooth. So we don't have really a quantitative measure about this. That's why I'm showing you the picture that what happens as we change the value of z in the mean and standard deviation, uh, standard deviation space a bit, we see that also the graph changes smoothly. So now coming to competing methods, there are graph-based methods and there are uh, text-based techniques. And these are the quantitative evaluation matrix which we take into consideration. So take first example, validity. So percentage of chemical valid points. So valid molecules. So how many of these molecules which you are generating are chemically valid or not? So this is the first measure. Second measure is novelty. The percentages of chemically valid, no, valid molecules not in the training data set. So they are chemically valid but they were not in the training data set. So your algorithm is not simply generating the points in the training data set. It's not generating points in the training data set, but it is generating something novel. So this is novelty. The third is unique, that the uniqueness. So uniqueness means that every time uh, the algorithm is generating new molecules. It's not that they are generating the same molecule again and again. So this is the third part. Fine. So <coughs> with this in with this in mind, with this in mind, let me show the validity example. So let me show the. I think uh, are you getting some. Um, Some captions are coming. So sorry, yeah, so this, uh, let us go to this validity example. So on the validity example, we see that uh, Nibha is our technique and Nibha star is our technique where we don't do the masking. Okay, so we see in our cases, the masking helps because when we do the masking, we are getting 100% valids. And most of the graph-based techniques can generate valid molecules, while the text-based techniques fails to generate valid molecules. Coming to the novelty, <coughs> coming to the novelty, <coughs> Uh, in most of the cases, is both of the cases, we are actually generating novel molecules and graph-based methods. Many graph-based methods novel, generate novel molecules out of which we have been generating the novel molecules completely. But in many cases, we see many cases we see that graph-based methods, the competing graph-based methods, fails to generate unique molecules. And this is, if you remember, I told you that in the beginning, many of these graph-based molecules take motifs and join those motifs or join those subgraphs to create the molecules, and that plays a negative adverse role against uniqueness. So you get molecules which are similar continuously. So out of every three molecules or after out of every 10 molecules, only three are three are unique. Whereas Nibai, since this doesn't go with this more with this motif uh, or subgraph concept, Nibai is generating unique molecules. So there are four things which are very important. We are generating very smooth molecules. We are generating valid molecules. We are generating novel molecules. And we are also generating unique molecules. So with this, we have introduced a variational autoencoder for molecular graphs, which thanks to several technical innovations beats the state of the art. 
So there are many interesting questions uh, which uh, can be answered in the future. There are many interesting questions which can be answered in the future, like generative models of dynamic graphs should would allow to simulate the chemical synthesis. So here we are taking a molecule as such, but can we use this graph to generate chemical synthesis? Like you have H2 plus O, H2 plus O2 produces H2O. So can that synthesis part or can that dynamics can be generated using graphs? So this is one important problem which we would uh, like to work. And uh, then uh, the another point is here when we have generated, we have not directed our generation, but we can direct our generation towards some desirable property. Say we want to generate some molecules which have high solubility. Okay, so how to direct that generation that can also be included or, or imbibed in our framework. So with this in mind, I am just shifting gear and going to the next part of crystalline materials. So Chris XPP, which has come out in the recent NPJ computational materials is an explainable property predictor for crystalline materials. And these are my co-authors. So coming to crystalline materials, let us uh, understand what are crystalline materials. So crystalline materials have material details like it has some magnetic properties, magnetic ordering, formation energy, okay, density, whether it is stable or not, and what is the band gap, etc. These are some state properties. And then there are some lattice parameters that whether, uh, how, what is the degree between two nodes, okay, it is fit uh, two nodes, how, uh, uh, how long is this bond, et cetera, et cetera. There are some lattice products and there are the atomic coordinates like NaCl. Fine, these are crystalline materials. So here we are working on deep learn, deep models for crystal you know, property predictions. So what are we doing? We are actually building fast and accurate prediction of different properties, for example, state properties, elastic properties, et cetera, for crystalline material. And that is a very challenging task and has a lot of interest to the material science community. Since if we have this property, I have told it in the beginning also, but I'm just repeating that it is imperative for finding new new functional materials. So presently there is some technique, many of you may be knowing as the density functional theory or DFT, which is an effective tool to assess several chemical properties. And most of the things are done based on uh, DFT, but it requires substantial com computational costs. And and we will show that also DFT has some sort of biases. And in recent times, several machine learning techniques have been proposed to enable fast and accurate prediction of different properties of crystalline materials. So there is a search of replacing DST in the community also. And if we see this fast uh, deep learning techniques, which has come out in recent times, they are either using handcrafted feature-based descriptor or the recent more deep learning graph, graph neural network generation, et cetera, et cetera. But as we know, generated um, generating handcraft features require specific domain knowledge and human intervention. Uh, which is not so good uh, if we are if we have to scale up. And then we have these deep models, which requires a huge amount of tap training data. And for some properties, we can have get some a lot of tag data, but for many, many properties, uh, there is not a lot of tag data. And also, how is this tagging done? Interestingly, this tagging is done through DFT. Okay. It's not that this tagging or this uh, uh, the properties are derived experimentally, that properties are calculated is using DFT. Anyway, so the data which we are getting in our typical annotation lingo, if we tell, these are silver annotated data. This, are, this, this is a, not a gold standard data. This is a silver standard data. And DFT error biases, so as for, for any silver annotated data, CFT error bias is will creep into the current models. 
And then there is the difficult problem of lack of interpretability and algorithmic transparency, which also needs to be tackled if we really want to help or work with the domain experts of material science. So the opportunity is a large corpus of unlabeled crystal data is available, which can then be used to learn the structural and chemical information of atoms and crystal graphs in an unsupervised way. So what is happening? So there are some properties for which there is a lot of less TAC data. So the TAC data is very less, but there is a large corpus of unlabeled crystal data, which can be used to learn the chemical and structural information of the atoms and crystal graphs in an unsupervised way. So that way uh, we can actually accelerate the the representation learning or make the representation learning better just by learning the structural and chemical information. Let me give you an example. And before that, just let me tell you what is our proposed uh, method. Our proposed method uh, is an explainable deep property predictor for crystal materials where we will have a pre-training sort of things and that will be done by Chris AE, the crystal autoencoder, and then we'll have a crystal explainable property predictor. So Chris AE, an autoencoder based architecture, which is trained with large amount of unlabeled crystal data, which leads to deep encoding module, capturing all the important structural and chemical information of the constituent atom. So it is a typical self-learning sort of framework. And once we dis do this, this learned encoding is leveraged to build up the property predictor Chris XPP to which the knowledge acquired by the encoder, which we have done in this step, the knowledge acquired by the encoder is transferred and which is further trained with a small amount of property track data, thus largely mitigating the need of having huge amount of data set tagged with a specific property. Okay, but please remember when we are telling this amount of data set which is tagged, it is tagged using DFT. So it is silver tagged. I will show you some results on that to understand the importance of our results. So first of all, let me, unlike molecules, a crystal is not a graph as such. A crystal is a continuum. So we have to, con we have to convert the crystal into a graph. So there are these atom atomic features, graph features, that is fine. But what we have to do, we have to take, say we took a graph or we took a molecule, we took a molecule, we know the constituent molecules of the crystal. We took one of the constituent molecules and, and added a eight Armstrong radius sphere around that molecules and saw how many of the other molecules, how many of the other molecules really falls, fall within the part view of eight Armstrong of this molecule. So we see that when we draw a sphere of eight Armstrong, one, two, three uh, yellow molecules are coming in, yellow atoms are coming within this pink atom. So we draw one, two, three, okay. And we see two, two blue atoms are connecting. So one, two, three, one, two, and just one green, so one. So this way, we are converting the crystal into a crystal graph, okay? And and the uh, and we also, unlike the previous thing, we also get the weights. We also get the weights. Judging from the distance, this uh, uh, pink molecule has with the first uh, yellow, yeah, pink atom, sorry, pink atom with the first yellow atom, second yellow atom and the third yellow atom. And these are the atom features, if we just uh, want to see it, like uh, group number, period number, electronegativity, covalent radius, valence electrons, etc., etc. So what is crystal, Chris A.E. doing? It is the encoder molecules that the crystal graph based on uh, graph convolution network we are having the crisp chemical and uh, structural information. I showed that. And then we have the decoder molecules. In the decoder part, we decode the node features, the eight features, and the graph connectivity, whether some two, two, uh, two 
atoms are connected or not connected and how are they connected. And this is trained, the parameters are trained by minimizing the reconstruction laws or different, we call global and local structural chemical information. So let us take this picture, which will give you a little better understanding. What is happening? We have the crystal graph and from that crystal, from that crystal graph, we showed this eight Armstrong sphere uh, uh, technique through which we get the crystal graph. Okay, and this crystal graph is put into a graph convolution networks where uh, through which you get the node embedding. We get the node embedding of each of the nodes. And from each of these nodes embeddings uh, through some small feed forward network, we derive uh, uh, we derive whether there is an edge between two nodes UV and how many edges are there. And then the node property of U and the strength of the weights of this K, um, K connections as each of the strength is SUV1, SUV2, SUV3 up till SUVK. So this is how we have the decoder molecule. And this is, uh, we have a simple reconstruction loss. And this way, the graph convolution neural network ultimately get trained. And we uh, painfully collected this crystalline uh, material science project is there. So there is a materials projects from where we collected 38,000 uh, crystalline materials and trained the system, trained the system and got the initial weights of the graph convolution neural network. So now these weights are transferred to the property predictor. And if I may take the property predictor into consideration, so this property predictor, we are telling it is an explainable property predictor. So we built a model explainability model by first putting a feature selector. Okay, and this feature selector is a trainable weights vector that selects. So this feature selector is, so we, have, we know there are node properties and node properties, which node property is important and which node property is not important is set by the feature selector. Okay, it's set by the feature selector and this is property specific. So if, if we are doing band gap, then perhaps, um, group number is important. But if we are doing magnetic property, then group number may not be important. So this feature selector is a filter in this way. It's a trainable weight vector that selects a weighted subset of important node level features for a Griffin property of interest. And just to uh, make things clear, these are the node level features, group number, period number, electronegativity, uh, covalent radius, etc. Just to make you uh, remember what is the node features. Okay. And then <clears throat> once we have this, the property predicted is designed specific to property. As I'm telling, it is specific to defined to property. And then once the graphs, node features pass through the property selectors and pass through the GNN, uh, GCNN, the graph convolution neural network, we have the node embeddings and node embeddings from the node embeddings with a simple aggregator, we have the graph embeddings. And from there, we have the multilayer perceptor and we get the property predictor, okay? So this is a very simple model. This is an end-to-end -end training which we are doing, but it is a very simple model and very simple straightforward model and which has two parts. One is the graph embedding module and one the property prediction module. And this is trained on less data. So in many cases, we have much less data about crystals property. Okay. But what has happened? We have not started from zero, but we have basically have the weights transfer training parameters from Chris A. So that is our hope. So with this in mind, with the structure in mind, I hope I have made the structure clear. How effective is the property predictor? How robust is the structural encoding? And how effective is the explanation? Let us ask these three questions one after another. So 
when we are talking about effective we are talking about performance so let us see performance here we have many uh, many important uh, uh, contemporary papers like cgcn and mpcgcn and lmnet xpp we see and what we do we deliberately work on less data like 20% of the data and 80% of the data is left for the testing so only trained or fine tune whatever you want to say the crystal xpp the property predictor is done on 20% of the data while 80% of the data it is evaluated and in all of the properties x so the lower the better and green is ours in all of these properties we see ours is performing better only in this case in this small case where we see lmnet is performing better what we understood what when we talked with domain experts again what we understood magnetic property really doesn't depend upon the structure so the structural informations may not be helping us too much in uh, in predicting this property so the second question again i have told you that all the data sets which we have got all the data sets which we have got are silver tagged what is silver tagged is the underlying data set is not experimentally derived but derived using dft so now let us think of the setup we consider a property predictor which has been trained with crystal whose particular property say band gap values has been theoretically derived using dft we have told that now after that we fine tune the parameters with limited amount of experimental data now we fine tune the parameters with limited amount of this experimental data. specifically this experiment i am explaining we collect 20 experimental instances from domain experts out of which we randomly pick 10 instances to fine tune the parameter and report the prediction values so now let us see this result so we have a material and the experiment is 0.72 0.72 uh, say dft is giving the result 0.36 let us not talk about this what is the exact meaning of 0.72 but you can understand that closer to 0.72 would be better so chris xpp first of all here okay chris xpp see this chris xpp here we are not putting in any experimental data then also we have got 0.9 which is better than DFT. See, we have trained or fine-tuned with DFT, but since the structural information which we have learned is so powerful, it is still beating DFT, although we have fine-tuned with DFT. But when we put a little bit of experimental data, it comes very, very close to the original experiments. It comes very, very close to original. And that is seen continuously. So this is uh, one way, uh, again, when we talk with domain experts, this is a very important and interesting results which can later be actually exploited. The last point about the explanation. So this feature selects us as is understood is, uh, and we have this lasso thing. So it is either putting, uh, one or zero, like it will allow for some cases group number to be one or period number to be zero. Okay, in this way, it allows uh, one or zero, and there is hardly any like 0.5 of group number, 0.7 of period number. It is not like that. So we have a sparsified case. And if we take something like this, uh, uh, like this molecule BA, uh, BA ER to F8 and see the formation energy and formation energy is like point, minus point our our prediction of formation energy is minus point minus 4.41 which shows that this molecule is stable and what we can see i'm just showing one thing that when we see the electronegativity field when we see the electronegativity field we see the difference is non zero the difference between the two molecules ba and er is not zero which is important for providing stability so we find that we are giving minus 4.49 and we can explain why this is negative because the electronegativity between barium and er is is not same and there is a non-zero difference 
So this way, this model can also explain a part of the results, why the result has come this way, which is also an important step forward. So coming to summary, in this work, we propose an explainable property predictor for crystal materials, crystal, Chris XPP to predict different crystal state and elastic properties with accurate precision with using small amount of property track data. We address the issue of limited crystal data of a particular property. And uh, what we find that our coding knowledge is extremely useful in debiasing DFT error. And with appropriate case studies, and you can see the paper, uh, the with appropriate case studies, we have shown for cases after case, says the feature selection module actually help us to mm. provide explanations and uh, domain knowledge domain experts have seen that and told that yes this is really providing explanations for the properties which we are seeing so to conclude uh, uh, we leverage the power of deep learning framework to learn enriched representations for molecular and crystal graphs which aids to discover new plausible molecules and predicting different properties of crystal materials. We are looking into some interesting directions for future work, a more fine grained pretend model for crystal graphs by capturing both graph level and node level features. So we are doing this for some, some time. And also we are trying to do, we are working on generative models, which learns to provide candidate molecules with desirable properties. Thanks for listening and I am open to taking questions. I Thank, you, Professor. Thank you, Professor Gagli, for the wonderful talk. Um, I would like to encourage audience if they have any questions. Yes, I have a questions. I can stop sharing perhaps it will it may help. Please yeah. go ahead. Yeah, yeah. My question would be is are you able to generate, for example, new composition or new graph or new crystals from from your graph autoencoder? From your crystal autoencoder. So for the crystal part we have not general means it, it is still working as a property predictor it's not a generative oh. model the molecule was a generative model here it's a property predictor so but potentially this can also be extended to a generative model okay thank you any other questions from the audience